Good afternoon, my people. I am so happy. First, we should all get to know each other better. So, let's go around and give everyone a chance to. I'm joking. This land is your land. This land is my land. When we work together, we are more successful. From California to the New York Island. From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway. Nobody living can make me turn back. This land was made for you and me. Hi, <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here, for coming to this. Um, Adi's biggest concern as an organizer was always turnout. He would lay awake uh, t or tossing and turning, worrying about turnout for events he was organizing. Um, so he would be so wonderful. So, so thrilled to see this wonderful turnout today. Thank you. So ever since Adi was first diagnosed with ALS, I've thought often of this famous passage from John Donne's Meditation 17. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. So we know the closing and opening lines of that passage, almost cliched, um, but I'm struck by the explanation in the middle. I can't think of a better way to describe Adi to say that, than to say that he was involved in humankind. He loved people, he loved community, he loved being in community and in the fight with the people in this room. He engaged in activism with joy and fun because he was fighting on behalf of humankind. 
Many of you have received late night emails from him scheming, one of his favorite words, um, scheming and dreaming up new strategies to confront politicians or get bills passed or fight the health insurance companies. And while these are serious topics, he loved to find fun, playful ways to confront them. Whether that was wearing camo to infiltrate a Mike Pence rally or bringing <laughs> two dozen protesters in bright green t-shirts to the Federal Reserve meeting in Jackson Hole. Activism was the perfect work for him because he could have fun with it. I mean, being a loud, obnoxious agitator on behalf of poor and marginalized people is <laughs> truly a win-win scenario. So we can think of all these big ways that Adi was involved in humankind, but I wanted to talk about how that showed up in his everyday life, and particularly some of the, t the times when I first noticed this about him, and we knew each other for a very long time, uh, knew each other over 20 years, and we're together for over 18 years. Um, so just a couple of stories. Very early in our relationship, when we had been dating for a couple of months, um, we went on a weekend trip to New Hampshire. And this was a big deal for two college seniors just getting into a serious relationship. I think we had to borrow his parents' car to get there. Um, so we were walking around, holding hands in this quaint town we were staying in. And as we were walking down the street, a small car accident happened a little ways away from us, just a fender bender. Um, like everyone else nearby, I sort of turned around in a rubbernecking, like, hmm, I wonder what's happening over there kind of way. Adi dropped my hand and sprinted towards the cars, running up to the driver's side window of one of them to make sure that the driver was okay. And I realized he could never just stand by if there was a way that he could possibly help someone. About a year later, after we had moved to Oregon for, together for my newspaper job, we went on our first, our first big vacation together to Mexico City. Um, I was a journalist at the time, and Adi was waiting tables before starting law school, so we didn't do a lot of fancy activities. Uh, we mainly spent our time, again, just walking around the city, um, talking with each other, um, getting to know the place, and Adi would get into these long, in-depth conversations with people we met on the street. Um, speaking to them in his barely passable Argentine-accented Spanish. <laughs> I was struck by how invested he was in these encounters with people he would never speak to again, and also by how much people loved talking to him, a random guy they would never speak to again. And I realized it was because he was genuinely interested in their stories, wanting to learn as much about them as he could in these brief interactions, and asking them questions that instantly moved beyond small talk. People wanted to chat with him because they could feel this genuine interest and connection that infused even these small moments. And so this is why his activism was so effective, because it was motivated by this real investment in other people's stories, by his involvement in humankind. And I think that's why his famous encounter with Senator Jeff Flake on an airplane, um, Liz Jeff's brilliant hashtag Flakes on a plane, um, generated so much interest because in that moment you can see Adi genuinely engaging with Senator Flake, having this real conversation and trying to figure out why does this person see this issue so differently from me? It was this unique blend of strategic bird-dogging with actual curiosity about what his apparent antagonist might have to say. And that characterized so much of what Adi did, and I think was rooted in a fundamental optimism about human nature and people's ability to change. He truly believed that a better world was possible. So in all of these big and small ways, Adi was involved in humankind. But he also reflected the other point of Dunn's meditation, any person's death diminishes me. Adi didn't believe that he was special, that there was any less of a reason for him to have ALS than anybody else in the world. When he was first diagnosed in 2016, he basically lay in bed for two days, and when he got up, he had come up with what he called his stump speech. <laughs> ALS was an enormous blow, devastating, but he had had 32 charmed years, and how many people could say as much? There was still so much that was good about his life. And even though there were many dark and difficult times over the next seven years, he maintained that perspective throughout. Just a few days before he went into the hospital in October, 
He had an interesting exchange with Carl, who offhandedly said something about Adi not being able to do an activity because it wasn't wheelchair accessible. Adi spent a few minutes typing and then said, Carl, it's true that my having ALS makes a lot of things difficult for us. Can you think of any ways it makes our lives better? And Carl thought for a minute and said he couldn't. Um, so Adi wrote some more and said, what about Izzy and Rosalba and Jamila? None of them would be in our lives if I didn't have ALS. And of course, he could have named many more people at that moment. Um, Carl smiled and said, oh yeah, and then went over and gave a big hug to Rosalba, who was sitting at the dining table doing her nursing school homework like on so many nights. <laughs> so in that spirit, um, in Adi's spirit, I wanted to close by thinking about some of the things that we have gained from ALS instead of just the things we've lost. The biggest thing we've lost, of course, being Adi himself. And first and foremost is Willow. Adi and I thought long and hard after his diagnosis about having another baby. And then once we decided to go for it, it took a lot of time and medical intervention to get pregnant. But we ended up with the perfect complement to our family and sister to Carl, um, one of the genuinely sweetest people I've ever known. Willow and Carl were the lights of Adi's life and the reason he fought so hard to stay here with us so he could take Carl to one more basketball practice or have one more living, living room dance party with Willow. Bedtime dance time, as we called it. At the end of his memoir, When Breath Becomes Air, Paul Kalanithi addresses his infant daughter, asking her when she looks back on her life, quote, not to discount that you filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied. I will tre treasure forever the simple joy that Carl and Willow brought to Adi when they climbed into his lap and snuggled with him. And my dearest hope is that they will also carry that embodied memory with them for the rest of their lives. ALS also brought us a deep sense of community, both in our adopted home of Santa Barbara and in the wider world. I've said many, many times how grateful I am to all of his caregivers for the incredible love and care they showed to Adi and to our whole family. They let us think of ALS as a long-term manageable condition rather than as a terminal illness. And in the process, they let us stay a family. To all of Adi's caregivers, past and present, Poppy, Lara, Ayana, Mario, Robert, Izzy, Rosalba, Andrea, Isai, Felipa, Patty, Pablo, Billy, Cesar, David, Juan. I can never thank you enough for being part of Adi's life, life, for being aunts and uncles, for Carl and Willow, and taking care of me too. So many friends and family have supported us that we had to argue every day with the hospital staff about having too many visitors in the waiting room. Adi knew how much he was loved and that we wouldn't continue in this fight alone. And finally, ALS gave Adi an incredible sense of purpose in his work, which also brought great joy and satisfaction to this period of his life. It never felt like he was taking time away from family to work. In fact, since we both worked from home, we spent pretty much all of our time together. But the work gave some meaning to ALS, even if it never justified it. Just as he had always listened to other people's stories, he used his own story to reach as many people as he could. The wonderful care and support that he received made him even more determined that every American who needed it should have the same opportunities. And I know these are goals we'll keep fighting for as we think about how we can live up to the example that he set for us. We'll keep working to create that better world that he envisioned. So thank you so much again for being here today and for being part of this beautiful community that he created. Before my diagnosis, I felt like I was a better father than activist. Kyle, you're going up the stairs for the first time. It just came naturally. We are about to give Carl his first bite of solid food. Rachel is an amazing mother and partner. We 
were college sweethearts. And she's an amazing partner uh, because she is brilliant and she laughs at my jokes, <laughs> even when they're stupid. <laughs> and then she tells me, stop, stop making stupid jokes. <laughs> Even when things got incredibly difficult, I saw a strength in her I didn't know anyone could have. After my diagnosis, I struggled to be present, struggled to believe life could get better. But then, in 2019, our daughter Willow was born. Bringing tremendous joy and love into our lives. And she already wants to do exactly what her cool, older brother is doing. The two of them have become the greatest motivators in my work. Even if I won't be here to see it, I want to show Carl and Willow a better world is possible. So much hope and love and beauty still exists. Aww. But, most of all, I want them to know. They have given me the moments of greatest love I have ever had in my life. <laughs> And see. Uh, I'm Adi's uncle, Yochai. Uh, in Eyes to the Wind, Adi recalls the first time he remembers we met when I came to visit when he was about two and fell in love with his babysitter, Deb, uh, and how that origin story created a lifelong bond between the three of us when she became his aunt. He also wrote uh, that our lifelong partnership uh, was something that he wanted for Rachel and for himself. And I know, Rachel, that the part of his life Adi would be missing most are those years with you raising Carl and Willow and continuing to grow and age together. We weep with you and for you. Adi also wrote in Eyes to the Wing that he and I bonded over wrestling and tickling when he was a toddler and a little boy. Well. Any of us who knew Adi knew that there was no way of becoming a lifelong friend better with Adi than fighting together and laughing together. Uh, and Adi paid it forward and, and, and tickled and wrestled my own sons who for their part paid forward to Carl and Willow. May this deep community and family embrace of ours continue to embrace you, Carl and Willow, all your lives with us. Adi had a deeply ingrained intuitive empathy and aversion to justice. One evening in Maine, he was about nine, he played with a lobster on the floor uh, for a while, only to see us plunge it into a boiling cauldron. He protested immediately to stop this, uh, and after the protest failed, he punished us all by going to bed without his dinner. An early sign of boycotts and protests to come. Later, as a law student uh, uh, at Yale, I remember Adi, the image of Adi and his friends getting up in the middle of a, a lecture by Jay Bybee and putting the Abu Ghraib-style hoods on their heads, standing for a minute as the room was silent, and then standing and throwing them at the feet of the man who had written the torture memos. But empathy requires opening up with your own pain, not keeping it bottled up. This was a lesson Adi taught me in one of the most painful moments we had together 
when I flew in to be for a few days with Rachel and Adi after the initial diagnosis with ALS. And I was trying to be strong and, and communicate strength and support to them. And at a certain point, Carl was napping and Adi and Rachel and I were sitting on the back porch and he turns to me and explodes at me, show something, show that you care. Don't keep it all bottled in. And I broke down weeping with him there and then and learned a lesson I will always remember uh, about what it means to be open, not just strong, what it means to allow yourself to be vulnerable in order to build strength together. Adi taught me all these things. But passion and intuitive commitment to justice will not alone get the job done. One of the remarkable things about Adi was his ability to be not only an all-in those, but also meticulously prepared, creative, and nimble. In Eyes to the Wind, Adi mentioned how in high school, he and I spent hours on the phone discussing his arguments in preparation for the debate team, and he was always the prepared debater. Uh, knowing full well that with anyone I love and respect, I'll tear his work to pieces in the first drafts. We continued this throughout his life, in law school, sure, the visually striking demonstrations were memorable, but much more important was the steady organizing, with it, whether it was universities allied for essential medicines, whether it was the immigrants and workers clinic, the focus was on effective organization and careful preparation. I remember well how floored I was when he sent me the first drop to the idea of, the, of Fed Up. Today, it seems natural, of course, the Fed and monetary policy are political. But at the time, it was way out, far left field, and no one, no one I talked to thought it was possible to build a social movement around the most technocratic, boring subject in the world and bring it to a human life. But Adi did. He dared to think it, and then he worked to make it a reality. Adi brought all of these together, the empathy, the humanity, the meticulous presentation, and my God, the debater's nimbleness, all together on the day on which he presented the at the first congressional committee hearing on Medicare for All. The committee chair was super solicitous, but basically the orientation seemed as though they all thought they had brought a, tot a totem, a symbol of patience, after whose statement they would move on to expert witnesses and pat statements and the normal thing. But they'd bargained without Adi. He sat there for eight hours, pushing the Democrats, typing with his eyes in real time as he thrust and parried with the Republicans, always with better facts, clearer memory of who had said what, when, and what's inconsistent about what they're saying now, correcting the experts and the Congress people alike. I have never seen power in a room like I did that day. I have never seen moral authority so brilliantly woven with detailed facts and clear-eyed analysis. Adi, as some of you may have experienced, knew how to criticize when he wanted to. And he reciprocated my own comments on his writing by reading and pushing back on mine from as early as when he was 19 or 20 and, and read my first book with extensive comments. Uh, and up to two weeks before he died, when he came out of the hospital the first time, and we exchanged text, and he asked me to send him a draft on an article of mine about law, power, and, cap and justice in capitalism. Because, after all, who knows better than Adi how law and policy structure power and justice in capitalism? I'm still waiting for your comments, Adi. I will always wait for your brilliant, incisive, sarcastic, passionate, and morally uncompromising comments. I think we will all, if we're lucky enough, we will all um, um, ask, what would Adi say about this? What would Adi say? Justice has no face to study. 
As many of you know, Adi shared so much with us. So many people knew him through his work or his writing or even the documentary that gave an intimate look into his life with his family. 
but there were also those of us lucky enough to know him as a friend. I met Adi's best friend, Nate, in 2018 as we planned a very ambitious RV trip from California to Maine. One of the many roles Nate took on was as Adi's earliest caregiver. It was remarkable to see him in action in both physical strength and character, lifting Adi from the wheelchair to the bed, helping him take a shower, and making sure he ate. But as we traversed the country, Nate became so much more. In many, word, in many ways, he became a caretaker for us all through his wisdom, his humor, and his faith. Nate is here in the audience with us today, but chose to record his reflections ahead of time. He has never loved the spotlight, but when he speaks, it is always poignant. It is my sincere honor to get to introduce him in those words today. I'm glad to be able to talk to you today about my best friend, Adi Barkin. I first met Adi when we were both 14 years old in Claremont, California. We bonded quickly over a shared love of Bob Dylan, NBA basketball, 1980s economy automobiles, and a general talent for being smart asses. People often ask me what it was like watching Adi grow up. And in some sense, I never quite know how to answer because I'm not sure that I did. Not that he didn't grow up, though he never lost his appreciation for sophomoric humor and outrageous behavior. What I mean is that more than anybody else I've ever known, he seemed fully formed from the start. Most of America was introduced to Adi when they saw him really putting the screws to Jeff Flake on an airplane. But I wasn't surprised, because I'd been watching Adi do stuff like that for 20 years already. I remember being in high school, maybe 16 years old, and I was watching him giving a certain chemistry teacher the full Jeff Flake treatment. And after weeks of watching this, I remember saying to Adi, you know, Adi, at some point, don't you have to let up? You know, he's, he's made his call. He's the teacher. You're the student. He's the adult. You're the kid. And you kind of owe him that respect, right? And Adi, looking at me like I had two heads, said, why on earth would I do that? If he wants my respect, he can earn it like anybody else. But that was Adi. Then I remember another day when he pulled up with a trunk full of yard signs opposing California Proposition 22, which defined marriage as being between a man and a woman. Anybody looking at the situation knew that it was a lost cause trying to defeat this proposition. They would also know that to be a 16-year-old boy publicly campaigning for an LGBT cause was to incur a real social risk but Adi took that risk unhesitatingly and largely alone, though he dragged me along with him like he would so many times in the future. And so I, I wonder now, what was it that enabled Adi to act in these ways that cut against the grain? What enabled him to see through bullshit so clearly? I think what he had was vision. He could see another world, a different world. I think the work of his life was to illuminate the outlines of that other world for the rest of us to see. I say that in some sense, I didn't see Adi grow up. In another sense, of course I did. I saw his deep love for Rachel. I saw him grow in that love, saw him learn a new gentleness and expansiveness. And, and these two kids, Willow and Carl, I don't think any other two kids have ever been so wanted or loved or cherished. You really meant the world to him. And so when Adi received his diagnosis, I grieved for him. I was in a daze because all I could envision that was coming was loss and decline and darkness. But of course, that's not what happened at all. I couldn't know at that moment how much light was about to come into our lives. Before too long, Adi and Liz had created Be a Hero. And not too long after that, we were on the road. And life in the early days of Be a Hero, out on the road, it could have this kind of charmed quality. Things would look desperate for a moment, and then the right door would open. The right person with the right gifts would appear at just the moment we needed them most. People like Liz, Jamila, Carmen, Ayana, Helen, Tracy, Julia, Anna Maria, Jen, without whom none of the work could have happened. 
And when Audie's condition began to overwhelm my ability as a caretaker, and I really started to get afraid for the chances we were taking out on the road. The heroes that appeared then, you know, so I'm talking about Izzy, Mario, Robert, Drea, Rosalba, so many more. And their competence, their capacity to care, their ability to show up through the hard days and the long nights, it, it just strikes me with awe. I am overwhelmed with admiration and gratitude. When we were out on the road, I was often surprised when strangers would try to pull me aside and they would want to ask, you know, how did he really get sick? You know, what was his diet like? Was there something in his environment? Did he catch a virus? And you realize what they were trying to do, right? They wanted something they could put between themselves and him. In this world, when people get sick, when people fall on hard times, we draw them out of the circle of humanity as quickly as we can. The first thing we want to know is what separates them from us. But here's the truth. Getting sick, being poor, being disabled, being vulnerable does not make you any less human. It makes you more. It makes you more human. Our imperfection, our incompletion, our contingency, our need, that's all that we are. It's all we have to offer one another. So as we traveled around, there were other stories we heard. Everywhere we went, people would come to Adi with their stories of suffering and struggle, how the bottom fell out of their lives, how they slipped through the cracks, how good insurance, good savings, good jobs, all went up in smoke the day they got their diagnosis, the day their accident happened, the day their child was born sick. And Adi listened to their stories. He took their pain and added it to his own. And they took his pain and added it to their own. And then together, they learned to tell a new story. This wasn't a story of despair, but of hope. It was a story of how they found community. It was a story of solidarity, of people saying, from this day forward, your pain will be my pain. Your struggle will be my struggle. It was a story of helpers and healers. It was a story of people who refused to turn a blind eye. People choosing to be concerned, choosing to become implicated. It was a story of immense hidden strength and unshakable dignity. And over time, the sound of that story became louder and louder. The sound of it would echo through the halls of Congress. It would reverberate out on movie screens and television sets and podcasts. In time, presidential candidates would line up to be a part of that story as well. That's the story of the other world. Because in this world, people fall every day. They fall ill, they fall on hard times, they fall from their expected station in life. And this world wants you to believe that once you fall, you just fall and fall and fall. But you don't. That's not what has to happen at all. Instead, you find your humanity, maybe even for the first time. And then you can find other humans. You find the other vulnerable, cast out people. You put all your brokenness together. And by the strange alchemy of political activism, what you can create is not weakness, but strength, not despair, but hope, not hatred, but love. And together you rise. That's the other world. It's already here, already rising, already breaking in from the margins, already telling a new and different story. It's in the outer places where the sick and the poor and the vulnerable gather. Every time this world creates a new victim, the other world gains a new citizen. That other world is everywhere. And once you have eyes to see it, you'll recognize it. I can recall late one night in 2018, hanging out in a hotel room in Minneapolis, working on a speech Audie would deliver the next day to a rally. We were searching for the words that would capture the urgency of the moment. And the words we landed on would become in many ways emblematic of the early Be A Hero movement. They were, I'm willing to give my last breath to save our democracy. What are you willing to give? You're gonna hear a lot about Adi today. And it's easy to find yourself shamed by the example of his life, all he was able to accomplish, all he was able to say in such few years. But my hope is not that you all leave here today with a heavy burden on your back, with some grim determination to do more, be more, work more, give more, care more. And Adi's isn't a straightforward story of going from strength to strength or just trying hard enough. Adi's greatest strength in this life was discovered in great loss. 
So I'd like to suggest how you might answer that question he asked years ago. What would you give? Give whatever's broken in you, whatever's imperfect and afraid and hurt and worn out in you. That's all. Give yourself and let your loneliness lead you to solidarity. Let your pain lead you to mercy. Let your fear lead you to hope. Turn your back on the stories that power tells about itself and tells about us and join your voice to others in telling a new story. Pledge your citizenship to that other world where mercy and justice reign. And trust that one day soon, we're all gonna live there together. But keep the faith. Thank you. To my beloved caregivers, who tend to me every hour of every day. Everything I have is only possible because of you. My work which gives me purpose. My relationship with Rachel which is still strong through all our challenges. And my ability to be a father to these two crazy, amazing, wonderful kids, Carl and Willow. Your dedication, compassion, and care has made my life an extraordinary one. You've brought me across the country to testify in front of Congress. Made it possible for me to be there for the birth of our daughter Willow. Even got me on the dance floor at a dear friend's wedding. None of this would be possible without you. You have given me a life worth living, and I cherish each of you deeply. Billy, Pablo, Isai, Andrea, Mario, Rosalba, Felipa, Robert, Izzy, and Patty. I am so grateful for you. My name is Isamar Barrios, AZ to the Barkin King family, <laughs> and many of you. Three days after my first ALS patient I cared for died, I met Adi. He and I had an instant connection, and he hired me right away. He, I didn't know just yet how much that day and this job would change my life. By the time I came to work with Adi, ALS had already paralyzed much of his body. Three weeks into my work, Adi had a tube put into his windpipe so that a ventilator could help him breathe. That surgery made it possible for him and other ALS patients to outlive the prognosis. It also meant that Adi would need 24 seven caregiving and I soon became part of that incredible team of nine. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, one of us was there. Suctioning secretions, changing the tubes, connecting to his ventilator, bathing and dressing Adi and administering meals through his feeding tube, and so much more. Adi at times struggled to grapple with all the loss that came with his diagnosis and all the things he could no longer do. Yet through it all, he was determined to be a present husband, father, colleague, and friend. As caregivers, we didn't see our jobs as just helping, keeping him alive. Each day we showed up to help Adi make a full life possible. When Adi could no longer hug Rachel, Carl, and Willow on his own, we helped wrap his arms around them. There's one special memory that I hold very dear. We were trying to convince Carl to give Abba a hug before bedtime, and Rachel couldn't do it, so she got on Abba's lap. And then Carl joined. And I captured that and I took a picture of it. Very special day. When his eyes were tired and he was struggling to communicate, we helped figure out what he was trying to say. We made countless trips in the red van to pick up Willow from preschool. Time and time again, we went to Carl's basketball practice and I made sure his Audi's wheelchair was positioned just right so he can watch him proudly. This past year was one of our best and most challenging. Adi wasn't simply dying of, or even just surviving ALS. 
he was experiencing new joys and finding new ways to thrive. We took the kids to Sky Zone and Disneyland. We even got Adi on a floating dock. Oh man, Rasab and I were nervous. <laughs> we also took Adi on his first flight to Barbados since his tracheostomy. In Barbados, he celebrated the union of dear friends. and watched Rachel dance the night away. He wanted to dance so badly. So he lifted his hands in the air and waved them from side to side. His smile went from ear to ear. On our next trip, just a few weeks later, we went to New York for Adi to receive an award. It was his first flight with the full family. Willow and Carl are still upset they didn't get the first class seat. They wanted to cuddle with Abba. As you just heard, Adi told us on Labor Day that our work as caregivers had made the last few years in his life possible. I feel lucky to have been a part of that, to have served as an extension of him. I feel lucky to have helped him to continue his urgent work, to continue being a parent to Carl and Willow, and a partner to Rachel, and so much more. But as much as I cared for Adi, he cared for me. Adi gave me the opportunity to enter his family and to love and receive love from them. Rachel, Carl, and Willow, thank you for letting me into your lives. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to stay as long as you guys will have me. On hard days, he kept me laughing. If I was curious about something I'd seen in the news, Adi was there to provide the context. <laughs> and I did it often. <laughs> when he asked, how are you doing? He really meant it. When tragedy struck my family, Adi was a safe place I could count on. Adi cheered me on through nursing school and celebrated with me when I fan finally graduated this year. Thank you. Thank you. We spent hours talking about my work and my vision for what I wanted the future to be like. The truth is, before meeting Adi, I sometimes felt hesitant to talk about my work because too many people don't value or understand the importance of caregivers. Adi valued me and helped me become a proud caregiver. I listened as he spoke about the need for major expansion of home care and the need to pay caregivers living wage. We deserve. And soon his clarity and conviction lit a fire in me to help carry this vision forward. So I want to end today by doing what I know Adi would by acknowledging and thanking the incredible team of caregivers that I got to work alongside. Our work is often not glamorous, and on days like today, it is full of grief. But I hope each of you feels proud of all that you have given Adi and what you continue to do for others each day. Rosalba? Can you please stand? Pablo, can you please stand? Felipa, can you please stand? Drea, can you please stand? Robert, can you please stand? Mario, can you please stand? Billy, can you please stand? And Isai, can you please stand? I also would like to ask Carmen Rhodes to stand because countless times she had to step into the caregiver role. To all of you who are here today, we will continue the fight to make sure that everyone can get the care they deserve. Thank you for your love and for your unfailing commitment to Adi and his vision. Thank you.
through this. Um, uh, I just want to reiterate, I, I mean, clearly uh, there is no cure for either at this point, but I want to make it clear that while Adi suffered with ALS, he never succumbed to an irony deficiency. <laughs> uh, and I think that when we think of Adi, uh, we think of his amazing smile. Um, I saw it first in a Starbucks in West LA <laughs> near Diane Feinstein's office. Um, we were, uh, I guess it was August of 2017, and we were gathered for a march to the senator's office on behalf of the Dreamers. And when I met Adi, he had just been told <laughs> that there was a counter protest uh, blocking our way. It was a bunch of newly emboldened anti immigration Trump zealots spewing hate and uh, sporting. They had baseball bats and they had like swastika tattoos. And Adi's eyes lit up and he said, <laughs> well, hells yeah. Let's go meet some Nazis. Put me up front. Excuse me, kids. Let a fucking Nazi punch <laughs> The guy with ALS out of his wheelchair because the publicity will be fantastic. Um, and Adi was, uh, his speech was labored at that point, uh, but he meant it and we did as we were told. And it was uh, not the last time that we would see Adi use his body as a uh, political weapon, just to reiterate, in case this is streaming, I guess I'm overly aware of cameras. <laughs> um, for those who may not know or who are watching at home, uh, Adi, probably before you became aware of him, was a notoriously effective, effective, progressive activist uh, long before he got sick. Uh, I first became aware of him with his fights uh, for a $15 uh, living wage on the East Coast and then um, his uh, brilliant fed up uh, campaign. And just a year before uh, before I met before I met him uh, at Starbucks, he was celebrating his first anniversary with the love of his life, Rachel, and they were basking in the glory of a newborn son, Carl, and a future that could not have seemed brighter. Rachel had just gotten a job here in paradise. Um, <laughs> um, Audie could continue his work as a lawyer for the Center for Popular Democracy. He could work from home. Uh, they were in love. Uh, their first dream had already come true and needed a diaper change. <laughs> um, they would raise a family. They had work that mattered. They were 32. With a long and beautiful uh, future uh, ahead of them. And a week later, Adi, uh, of course, was diagnosed. Um, occasionally, only occasionally in our lives, we encounter these extraordinary people um, who somehow see their own unimaginable um, suffering uh, as an opportunity to alleviate the suffering of others. Um, they, of course, organize religions around people like that, uh, which, uh, of course, Adi would scoff at the idea that he was extraordinary, just like he would wince if you happened to call him inspiring. <laughs> 
Adi wanted us all to know that we have a capacity to be extraordinary. He wanted us to know that every voice deserves to be heard and that the voices we are not hearing are the ones that we need to hear the most. Adi's only religion was democracy, a disorganized religion, to be sure. <laughs> and Adi believed that it was up to us to organize it. He would call his organization Be a Hero, not I'm a Hero, <laughs> because he knew that we all have a capacity to transform despair into hope and to put hope into action. And Adi knew that our world, our country, that our lives depend on that capacity. So under the most extreme conditions imaginable, Adi would show us the way. And he would do it with joy, and he would do it with a vengeance. With the help of his hilarious co-conspirator, the remarkable the remarkably fertile Liz Jaff. <laughs> Blessed be the fruit. Um, Adi, of course, confronted Jeff Flake on a plane. I was watching yesterday the documentary and thinking, Jeff Flake looks like Abby Hoffman now. Um, but the video, of course, went viral. He was able to found Be a Hero. And then he very strategically hit the road uh, to fight for the ACA, to fight for Medicare for All before the 2018 midterm election. And with a body that was betraying him, time running out, Adi understood that he had a, he had a unique opportunity to highlight the insanity of the richest nation in the history of the world's inexcusable refusal to take fundamental care of its own citizens. Let them tell a dying man that health care isn't a human right, Adi was saying. Let them say it to my fucking face. And with that, Adi obliterated the line between what is personal and what is political. The House flipped in that election. Uh, the ACA was saved, and I don't think anyone did more than Adi to make that happen. Afterwards, I think it was Nancy Pelosi who said that he, he was the most effective uh, political activist in the country. By then, Adi had become a dear friend, and when Amy and I were getting married, we asked him uh, to perform the ceremony. Adi could no longer speak, but he could type with his eyes, and a computerized voice would, his voice would recite the words we gathered at City Hall here in Santa Barbara, and uh, Adi could still angle his head slightly and look from one of us to the other. And he uh, held us with his eyes and in turn gently pressing us to uh, cherish and protect uh, the miracle of love in a world where life is so fleeting and so terribly, uh, terribly precarious. Um, his smile at the end of the ceremony was a consecration that uh, we will carry with us forever. It was more than a call to joy. It was an insistence upon it. Um, this is a, a shattering loss, of course, most deeply to Rachel and to Carl and Willow, and I just want to say um, Rachel's unimaginable strength and generosity was 
what allowed Adi to perform a miracle to uh, create a life after his diagnosis that was the opposite of a tragedy. And while our hearts are broken today, Adi forged a time that was an affirmation of his most deeply held beliefs. It was a profoundly useful life. It was a life of community, and most importantly, it was a life of intense joy for a man who was incapable of taking the unexpected opportunity to see his children grow for granted. There are no words to express uh, what Adi's loss means to them, to his parents, to the rest of his family, to everyone uh, who got to know him, take care of him, fight alongside him, and be his friend. And of course, we find ourselves at a moment when it seems the world needs Adi Barkin <laughs> more than all, and more than ever. Um, so let's honor him by continuing his work. Let's honor him through Be a Hero. I know if Adi were here, he would want us to go out and expose the scam of Medicare disadvantage. Um, and uh, to continue the ongoing fight uh, for everyone to have access to the health care they need, to have health care as a human right, including what he experienced um, and needed uh, in the last years of his life, uh, the home care that extended his life and extended his definition of his own family. And I want not only to acknowledge all of those people, um, but I want to make sure that we all honor Adi and go out there and make sure that home health care workers everywhere get the wages and the benefits that they deserve. So Adi's uh, legacy, of course, is a reminder to us all of the obligation that we have to care for the most vulnerable among us. It is a reminder that we don't just get a democracy. We have to make one every damn day. It is a reminder that is, it, it is up to us to hold this country to its spectacular, unfulfilled promise through the joyous, relentless, and fierce practice of democracy. It is a reminder that even in the darkest times, there is no such thing as false hope. There is only hope. And as Adi liked to quote, hope is a hammer. And it is a reminder that despair is a luxury that our children cannot afford and that action is the antidote to despair. So to honor Adi, let us continue his fight for justice and to truly honor him, let's do it with a smile. <laughs> Oh, come on, say action. <laughs> Go ahead doesn't work. I quite like treating a bumpy car with a hand that doesn't work. Build some momentum, right? And a lot of spaces in jail, protesting Kavanaugh. Oh my god, how much of the RV is flooded? What happened? I didn't have the 
the sewer hose on, so I, I was not being mindful of how much water was going down the drain. I mean, if the tank's going to overflow, that's what you want. Not the black one. Right, it's not the one we're f***ing <laughs> Tasty scooter. <laughs> I think we're good with, with these one takes. I feel feel confident about them. Here in Minnesota, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even read it off the page. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. It's, yeah, that's how they pronounce it in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm John Favreau. I was President Obama's head speechwriter, and uh, now I host a podcast called Pod Save America. Uh, I met Adi in December of 2017. It was the first of many times uh, he was a guest on our show. It was just after he went viral for confronting Jeff Flake, so we asked him about that. Then Adi asked us why Barack Obama couldn't get the public option passed along with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, then he grilled us on a few more topics. And when we finally pointed out that he had completely taken over the interview and was basically hosting the show now, he said, too bad, guys. Dying man gets to do what he wants. In the last eight years of his life, Adi Barkin was a dying man who did what he wanted. Like other people facing a terminal prognosis, he took special trips and reconnected with old friends and spent as much time as he could with the people he loved. But what Adi truly wanted was to use his death as a way to help change the political conversation around health care in America. And I think it's worth reflecting on why he was so successful why he was called the most powerful activist in America and one of the most influential people in the world, why he has been mourned and remembered by senators and House speakers and presidents and maybe most importantly, thousands and thousands of people who he never met. Part of the reason, I think, is that Adi was a brilliantly effective organizer long before he had ALS. He was the rare wonk who conveyed the human stakes of even the most complicated policy debates in a way that was as accessible as it was motivating. He never backed down from a fight, but he never went into one without a strategy to win. He was comfortable making powerful people uncomfortable and gifted at rallying perfect strangers to his cause. His anger was righteous, but never performative. He didn't need to signal his virtue, he exuded it. And he took seriously the words of Dolores Huerta, that every moment is an organizing opportunity, every person a potential activist, and every minute a chance to change the world. It wasn't surprising then that Adi saw his death as one last organizing opportunity, one final chance to change the world. And he brought all he had to that healthcare fight, including an incomprehensible amount of courage and determination to endure a journey that would have left a physical and emotional toll on even the healthiest person, let alone someone whose body was failing them, delivering speeches long after his voice gave out, attending protests long after he couldn't march, testifying before Congress, grilling 
presidential candidates driving across the entire country in an RV. What made Adi truly extraordinary, though, was not just what he did, but how he did it. You can be a hero, is what Adi said to Jeff Flake on that plane. You can save my life. He didn't berate him or scold him or mock him, even though that might have been more satisfying and gained even more attention. He didn't question the senator's motives. He simply asked that he live up to his stated principles. You can be a hero. It wasn't an admonition, it was an invitation. Not because that's what civility requires, but because that's what democracy requires. A presumption of good faith with the intent to persuade each other to see or think or act differently. And no one understands that better than organizers. No one understood that better than Adi who wrote that his job was to meet people where they are, bring them into a shared space, and move them together towards a common goal. And when that doesn't work, when the best efforts to persuade fall short, as they did on the plane that day, organizers come up with a new argument, develop a new strategy, look for a new audience. We try again. And no matter how long it takes, no matter how difficult it may be, we don't give up on debating and persuading and campaigning and voting because that's democracy. It can be messy and disappointing and maddeningly unfair. But the alternative to building power through persuasion is to build power through lies or corruption or force. The alternative is what we saw take place at the U.S. Capitol three Januaries ago. And that's why we can't give up on making this experiment work. Adi had more reason than most to let his frustration and exhaustion with politics harden into bitterness or resentment or cynicism. No one would have begrudged him if he called it quits, if he just decided to stay here and spend his last days with Rachel and Carl and Willow. But he believed that wasn't a luxury he could afford. Not for himself, not for his family, and especially not for the people whose lives depend on how many of us show up to make our voices heard, on how many of us stay in the fight even when it seems impossible to win. The first time I read Adi's memoir, I cried a lot. I couldn't stop thinking about the pain and the fear he wrestled with after getting his diagnosis. How hard it all was on Rachel and his family and his closest friends. How unimaginably difficult it must be to make sense of your own death. It stayed with me. But as I watched Adi continue to fight in these final years, a joyful warrior until the end, I realized that what will stay with me much longer is the answer he gave to a friend who asked where he found his spirituality. Democracy, I realized. That was where I found my first principles. The notion that we should order our world based on decisions that we make together that our fate as individuals is tied inexorably to the fate of others. That political struggle is timeless, essential, and liberating. This, I realized, was my religious conviction. This was my secular faith. More than anything else, I had spent my career in pursuit of a more just and equitable democracy because I understood now it was what I believed in most deeply. None of us can be sure how long we have or what might come next. All we know for certain is that we don't have to take life's unpredictable journey alone. 
that in a world filled with too much cruelty and sorrow, the truest source of comfort and fulfillment comes from the people we love and are loved by. And what Adi showed us, what he taught me, is that collective struggle isn't just a means to pursue that more just and equitable democracy. It's also an end to itself. It's how we make meaning from our time here. And when that time has passed, it's how we find peace in knowing that we spent our lives trying to make each other's better. That we heeded the words from St. Augustine's prayer book that sustained Adi when he needed it most, words that Nate first read to him. You have given me work to do for the greater good, and you have given those closest to me to love that we might find joy in each other. Give me wisdom to respond to your call in both and to receive them both as gifts from your hand. Adi Barkin responded to the call. May the rest of us continue to find the strength and the wisdom to do the same. And now it's my honor to introduce someone who has also devoted her life to serving the greater good. She's a trailblazing leader, a brilliant strategist with the heart of an organizer, and I believe she will go down as the greatest speaker of the House in the history of the United States, Speaker Emeretta Nancy Pelosi. Thank you, John Favreau, for your introduction and your words about our fearless hero, Addie Barkin. And thank you, Rachel, for your courage to care for Addie and to advocate for home health care and our heroic caregivers. Let us all show our appreciation to them with gratitude for what they have meant to your family and to all of our families. To you, Rachel, and to Carl and Willow, it is my sad privilege to bring condolences from the Congress as we mourn your loving husband and their father, a clarion voice for justice and a great American patriot. For all of us who have had the privilege to work with Adi and to see him in action, know that his name is synonymous with extraordinary courage. It took courage to share his powerful story and to fight for an essential truth that health care is a right, not a privilege. It took courage to take on the insurance industry, pharma, and dark money to defend patients' rights and protections for persons with disabilities. It took courage to come to the Capitol Hill to confront members of Congress to insist on health justice for all. And as we all know, Addy was never shy of telling us exactly what he thought. We all got his missives by call, by text, by Zoom, and we cherish them. And it took unimaginable courage to devote every ounce of his strength to building a brighter, fair future for his children and all children, a future he knew he would never see. I last saw Addy last September at the Four Freedoms Awards in New York, where he was fittingly awarded the Distinguished Freedom From Want Award. It was my privilege to be with him and his beautiful family that day, to hear him speak forcefully, urging us all to be a hero, and again, to tell him that he was our hero. Addie's leadership was a blessing, inspiring millions of Americans to take action and demand the health care that we all deserve. His words reverberated not just through the halls of Congress, but in big cities and small towns and in the hearts of the millions of Americans that he inspired. And he leaves behind a movement that will continue to catalyze much needed change as we proudly carry on his fight to save our health care. So my name is Adi Barkin. I'm the campaign director for Fed Up, which is our national campaign for a strong economy. He's always been this way, just willing to really confront the injustice and unfairness. Let's give it up to all of you for being part of this movement for worker, racial justice, and economic justice. 
He helped immigrant workers, members of Make the Road New York, recover millions of dollars in stolen wages. He helped draft and win paid sick day legislation in New York City that gave millions of workers the right to get sick without losing their job. If you look at the programs that he's even started, like Fed Up or being such a part of local progress, it's always been about building this kind of world that we want to see. Before Abby got sick, he had already made so much happen. And then I took a plane that changed my life. My next guest made headlines when he confronted a Republican senator on an airplane. This is your moment to be American hero. Be a Hero is a new campaign that we launched this week to urge people to stand up, tell their stories, confront the elected officials. When we decided to form the Be a Hero PAC, if they voted for the tax bill, if they voted to cut health care for people like Adi, we would replace them. In the first few years of Be a Hero, we drove across the country during the midterm elections, fought to stop Kavanaugh, and testified in front of Congress in support of Medicare for All. Our time on this earth is the most precious resource we have. Right after Medicare for All, we're like, our proposal is we're going to invite every single one of the presidential candidates to come speak with Adi. Mr. Vice President. How you doing? Adi, how are you, pal? The invitation that Adi gave to Senator Flake in that plane be a hero is an invitation that then he extended to everyone. One of the things we're trying to capture are people's personal stories and then use Adi's platform to lift those up. I've been incredibly frustrated by the lack of response from Peter Roskam. He has never once in the past two years had a town hall for his constituents. Someone who is literally spending the last days of his life advocating for health care just makes me feel like I have to do more. It's the time to step up. Be a hero and go I have stage four colon cancer, so um, I, uh, I'm in there <laughs> fighting the fight for everybody. I'm like Adi, I just fight. <laughs> and that's the beauty of democracy, that together we can be more than the sum of our parts, and we can be more than our individual selves. This morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, there ain't 
no harm with you by Let's hear it one more time for the Resistance Revival Chorus. I keep trying to join the men's auxiliary. So, um, will you raise your hand if Adi ever made an organizing ask of you? All right, and keep it up if you were able to say no. I thought so. I never figured out how to say no to Adi Barkin. His first big ask of me was back in 2013, during my first term in the city council. Adi had drafted a discharge petition to push a bill guaranteeing paid sick days for workers onto the council floor over the opposition of the speaker, and he expected me to be the first one to sign it. A big risk for a council freshman. Now, I tried to trick him by signing first, but in the third block on the list, hoping maybe the speaker's ire would then be directed at the people who signed ahead of me. Adi was a little disappointed, uh, but he accepted my promise to help get the remaining signatures needed to move the bill. This was before his diagnosis with ALS, when Sarah Johnson and I had the blessing of working with him to build local progress, a movement of local elected officials that helped pass legislation like paid sick days, minimum wage increases, policies that welcome immigrants in cities all across the country. Thank you, Greg Kassar, Helen Gim, John Abalos, Nisha. Oh, yeah, let's hear it for all of them, come on. Uh, Ivan, Tarsi, and Sarah most of all. After his diagnosis, as you've heard, Adi struggled with the darkness of his death sentence, but he found more courage and organized more relentlessly than anyone we will ever know. His next big ask of me came in 2017 when Adi summoned us to Washington to get arrested in that effort to stop Congress from taking away his health care and that of millions of others. We sang, this land is your land, as the Capitol Police arrested us. Organizing with Adi was a blessing, but not always an easy one. He had the brilliant knack, some might call it an obsession bordering on irritating everyone around him, of believing it was possible to win underdog campaigns by identifying all possible levers, debating until you had the best strategy, and relentlessly pursuing bold ideas with that dogged tenacity. As Sarah says, Adi had technical genius, but he wasn't a policy technocrat. He was media savvy, but not a comms guy. Through research, through long debate and even longer memos, he was always coming up with disciplined strategies 
not only to achieve policy wins, but to change what's winnable. Adi's last big ask came last spring, as he realized that so-called Medicare Advantage is eroding America's most trusted public health care system, knowing that we'll never get to Medicare for all through Medicare for fewer and fewer, Adi raised his by now computerized voice to stop this dangerous privatizing trend. This time, Adi had two asks, an easy one, work with Jamila to convene a dinner at our home to raise awareness, of course, and a hard one. He wanted me to reject the Medicare Advantage contract for New York City, which had already been approved by the city's union leaders. I, I'll be honest, I really wanted to duck this one. <laughs> While he never shied away from making a hard ask, uh, he didn't hold people accountable through shame. Uh, instead, with that devious glint in his eyes when he smiled, he invited us into the role that we can play in fighting for that more just and compassionate world. I rejected the contract. After his diagnosis, he realized that uh, his own story, his failing voice, his dying body uh, had become powerful tools to add to his organizing toolkit. Uh, as John said, Adi turned dying into organizing. Last winter, he wrote to us about singing This Land is Your Land again, this time with Carl and Willow singing along with the recording that we heard him singing earlier. And he wrote, when the song was over, Carl said, Willow, that's Abba singing. Willow laughed, pointed at me, and said, no, this is Abba. Carl explained that I sang the song when I could still walk before he was born. And then I got to tell him that actually, I recorded that song when he was a baby, so he would know what I sounded like and know that I love him. I didn't dare imagine back in 2017 that I would someday get to listen to him sing along with me let alone that his sister would make us a trio. It's a simple thing, he wrote, a father reading stories and singing songs with his children. And I wish that I could use my silly voice to read them stories and play the guitar as they sing. But I have learned, and I relearn every day, that the antidote to being sad about everything I don't have is to be grateful for all that I do. Carl and Willow, he loved you so much. And of course, having reduced us to tears with the email, Adi then pivoted to an ask. None of what I have would be possible without my incredible team of caregivers. Without them, I would have to live in a nursing home or not at all. Millions of Americans are not so lucky. And could we please contribute to be a hero for its campaign to expand Medicare's home care program to cover more people? This Thanksgiving, less than a month after Adi died, Rachel carried that ask forward in an email to all, expressing gratitude to Adi's caregivers as she did here, and raising money to make sure that Be a Hero can continue to fight for them. For everyone taking part today, we are Adi's living legacy, the community of people who will never be able to say no to him. Look, sometimes that'll be hard. When I flew out here to Santa Barbara just before Adi died, I had not yet raised my voice to call for a ceasefire in Gaza, but I knew what Adi would expect. An Israeli citizen and a Jew, Adi was a fierce critic of Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. And while he grieved the horrific Hamas attacks on October 7, I knew he would be outraged by Israel's brutal response. And I joined the call for a ceasefire shortly after. <laughs> to Today is about remembering and celebrating him, but let's be clear, it's also an organizing project. <laughs> Adi turned dying into organizing. It's up to us to make remembering him into one. Of course, Adi actually managed to foresee this too in the Nation article where he reinterpreted Reinhold Niebuhr's serenity prayer to seek collective courage first, wisdom second, and serenity only at the end. Adi wrote, it is in these moments of defeat that hopeful collective struggle retains its greatest power. I can transcend my dying body by hitching my future to yours. We can transcend the darkness of this moment by joining the struggles of past and future freedom fighters. 
five years before he died, he was assigning us organizing tasks for his memorial service. And that is how, he said, when we reach the end of our lives, we will find peace in the knowledge that we did our best. You did transcend your dying body by hitching your future to ours, Adi. And you didn't lose your voice. You gave it to all of us. And I promise we'll keep saying yes to all of your organizing asks. Now, I did manage to make a couple good asks of him. In 2018, when the Be a Hero bus rolled through New York, Adi joined the town hall of an insurgent congressional candidate who, unlike most of the rest of the world, he had supported in her primary and whose upset win had shocked the world and changed what we thought was possible when we have the courage to fight for justice. Uh, I asked if I could tag along, and that's how I first met Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's here with us today. And in 2019, I asked Adi to introduce me to Elizabeth Warren. They had become close through Adi's work and recognized a kindred spirit. She had come out to Santa Barbara and gotten to know Rachel and Carl too. Like Adi, I was about to endorse her for president and get busy organizing for her in Brooklyn along with a teacher friend of mine. She had tons of people supporting her, but thanks to Adi's introduction, she wrote back with these words, I'm so glad we're in this fight together. It's gonna take all of us. Please tell Liat that teachers rock, though she probably knows that already, and tell your son and daughter that their mom and dad are pretty cool too. Stay strong out there. Please join me in welcoming one of the very few people whose persistence could hold a candle to Adi Barkin, United States Senator Elizabeth Warren. I am here today to honor Adi Barkin. I admired Adi with my whole heart. I am also here to say thank you to Rachel and Carl and Willow and Adi's parents, to his family, to his friends, to his caregivers for sharing Adi with the rest of the world. Adi was family. In my office, I have a picture that's been there for years now. It's Adi holding baby Carl while Rachel laughs. Everyone in the picture has huge smiles. Carl has his tongue out in the middle of it. It makes me smile every time I look at it. Now there's a lot to say about Adi, about his commitment to his family, about his wicked sense of humor, about his good soul. But today I want to talk about one thing I particularly loved about Adi, his relentlessness. Adi lived a life of purpose. Adi was a man on a mission. Adi fought hard for what he believed in. I admired him and I was inspired by him. I first met Adi back in 2013. I was a baby senator and Adi was ready to tangle with a wild and crazy place, the Federal Reserve. Now, when most people hear about monetary policy and the Fed's dual mandate for price stability and full employment, <laughs> their eyes glaze over, their faces go numb. If you look closely, you can actually see them counting off the seconds until they change the subject. But not Adi. Adi rubbed his hands together and made it his mission to stir up attention and pressure and interest in an institution that most people had overlooked. Now, why the Federal Reserve? Remember, this was more than a decade ago, at a time when most people saw the Fed as both complicated and distant. The number one book about the Fed was called Secrets of the Temple. <laughs> oh, please. Um, distant and untouchable, but not for Adi. He recognized that the Fed's monetary policies touch the lives of real people every day. For years, 
the Fed's interest rate policies had been working great for the big boys on Wall Street. Meanwhile, workers and families on Main Street were paying the price. A soft labor market had made it harder for workers to organize and demand a higher pay. And the Fed was determined to keep that labor market soft. Adi was bold. He believed he could help influence those policies to tilt them just a little less toward billionaire investors and a little more toward the financial security of American families. So Adi did what Adi does. He organized. He built a coalition of workers and activists and economists and lawmakers like me to challenge the Fed's perpetual tilt to prioritize Wall Street over workers. Now, you're going to be surprised to hear the next part. The Fed doesn't like public criticism. It is an elite insulated institution of technocrats with very little transparency. Adi didn't care. He built a movement he called Fed Up. You all have heard some about it today. But here's the part I want you to hear from me. Because of Adi, America's understanding of the Fed would never be the same again. In August 2014, Fed members and a few invited select elite economists showed up for the Fed's annual conference in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Now, participants expected the usual genteel closed-door conferences that gave them a chance to tell each other what a great job they were all doing. And then Adi showed up, and he didn't come alone. He brought protesting workers wearing bright green t-shirts, and they chanted, full employment now, full employment now. They asked uncomfortable questions like, who does the Fed work for? Adi confronted the then chair of the Federal Reserve. The recovery had been so good for Wall Street, but Adi wanted to know where that recovery was for workers. And when Adi said workers, he meant all workers. The Fed's policies were hurting black workers the most, a point that Adi drove home with relentless determination. With Adi leading the charge, Fed Up released a study titled Main Wall Street, Main Street, and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. He showed how the Fed's policies contributed to higher unemployment and lower wages for black workers, and how this structural inequity pervaded the American economy. Adi organized press conferences in eight cities with regional Federal Reserve banks to highlight the study's findings and the racial injustice of the Fed's policies. Adi forced the Fed's leaders Yellen, Powell, Brainerd, and others to meet with him and to meet with other fed up activists. Adi made a difference. I, I, for me, you have to look concretely at what happened. Just a few examples. Adi signed up then presidential candidate Hillary Clinton on his fed reforms. After Adi repeatedly called out the Fed's coziness with the banking industry, more than 100 lawmakers in Congress signed on to letters supporting his Fed reforms, and Adi got results. He proved that even America's most insular institutions, like the Federal Reserve, could be changed by a dogged, determined, persistent movement of ordinary people. Today, bankers are not the only ones who influence the Fed. The press, the public, and Congress all bear down on moderating Fed policies to abide by the Fed's statutory mandate to consider unemployment and family economic security in their policies. And we can all thank Adi for that. The Fed Up campaign is just one example of how Adi worked. About four months after Carl was born, about the time of the picture that sits in my office, Adi learned he had ALS. And at that point, 
even an all-in activist like Adi could have chosen to focus only on himself, but not Adi. Instead, he dived even deeper, this time in the fight for health care. When Trump and Republicans decided to repeal the Affordable Care Act, they looked unstoppable at that moment. Unstoppable. Millions of people, particularly those with pre-existing conditions, were about to lose coverage and, for some, to lose the lifelines that kept them alive. So again, Adi did what Adi always did. He organized and he fought back. He confronted powerful people. He toured the country to mobilize grassroots supporters for the cause. And we all know about flakes on a plane. But Adi went right up to him to ask him to be a hero and to protect the Affordable Care Act. He stepped up at the first congressional hearing, passionately defending Medicare for all. He wrote op-eds. He launched an organization, Be a Hero, to support politicians who would expand health care access. He led one protest, and then another, and then another, and another. And when we finally beat back the attack on the ACA by a single vote, Adi didn't declare victory and quit. He swung directly into action to demand more access to health care. He campaigned actively in the 2020 election. He pressed candidates to support greater access to health care. He hosted interviews. He spoke at the Democratic National Convention. He reminded America of what is possible. Up until the very end, Adi and his family sacrificed so much to fight for a better health care system and a better world. And they did so with grace, with courage, and with heart. So I say it one last time publicly. Thank you, Adi. Thank you for your vision, for your leadership, for your steely determination. Your time here on Earth was too short, but you made every minute count. And for that, each one of us will be forever grateful. Thank you. About our cruel health care system, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Right now, our health care system is the opposite of what justice looks like. There is no justice in a cruel system that puts profits over people's lives. Everyone at Be A Hero knows firsthand the cruelty of America's broken health care system. It isn't health care, it's... CEO care. People should not have to choose between being healthy or being broke. It's frustrating as hell. It really is. We live in the richest country in the world, and yet 23 million of us have medical debt. More than 27 million of us are uninsured. And almost 45 million of our medical claims are denied every year. It's not about the people that are paying in, it's about the people at the top who sit on a board and want more money for a yacht. I shouldn't have to move abroad to get the level of health care that I need. We refuse to allow greedy corporations to continue setting the standards of what we should expect from our health care system. Together with patients across the country, we forced insurance companies into reversing life-altering claim denials. We've challenged the most powerful pharmaceutical corporations to make COVID-19 vaccines and other medicines affordable for all. We've worked in Arizona to mobilize thousands to force action to tackle medical debt. We've called on our nation's leaders and lawmakers to strengthen and expand vital public programs like Medicare, 
and to make critical investments in home care for elders and people with disabilities who need it. Each one of you, whoever you are, wherever you live, has a right to affordable and comprehensive health care that you can count on. I can't see that far into my own future. That's why we at Be A Hero are building a national movement for health justice. One that centers those most harmed by our current system and those most poised to benefit from its transformation. Sick and disabled people, undocumented people, people of color, and so many more. No matter what your health situation is or life situation, there is always something you can do to advance this movement. And even through hard, we still have a voice and we still have an obligation to do what we can to make things better. I'm not afraid to speak truth to power. We'll fight them with everything we've got and we'll keep on doing this for years to come. The better world we're building is entirely within our reach. Shortly after Adi invited me to co-lead Be A Hero, I came to visit Santa Barbara for the first time. We spent our days with Carmen talking about what it would take to build a more powerful movement for healthcare justice, then stayed up late talking about our childhoods, our friendships, our heartbreaks, our health challenges. And then in the evenings, Rachel and I cooked dinners together and quickly I saw her brilliance and strength. I read Koki in the City to Carl and Willow more times than I can remember. And all day long, I watched Ad, as Adi's highly skilled team of caregivers provided for his needs with deep care. As I hugged everyone goodbye, I knew that I was saying that saying yes to this job meant that someday I would suffer a broken heart. Adi, with his abundant hope, thought he might live another decade. I too thought we would have more time to take on the big health insurance co corporations, to laugh at his jokes, to hang out together with his hilariously precocious children as they met my child to come. I was not ready to plan Adi's memorial. I do not yet know how to lead Be A Hero without him. I do not know how to navigate this world without my friend in it. I found myself thinking that in his own way, Adi tried to prepare me, he tried to prepare all of us for this. In almost four years of knowing and working with each other, he has taught me more about facing loss and grief than anyone else in my life. Adi showed me that it is not just possible to survive loss, it is possible to be transformed by it. First, you have to feel it fully. You have to face the fear that it might wreck you until you realize that somehow your broken heart is still beating stronger than ever that you are different and still here in spite of it all. For Adi, the losses were significant. He wouldn't be able to grow old with Rachel, lift Willow into the air, or dribble a basketball with Carl. He would no longer be able to speak, and despite the miracle of Igay's technology, his eyes would never be able to keep up with the pace of his brilliant mind. There would be no more pasta dinners and no more runs against the Santa Barbara landscape. Adi faced periods of deep sadness where every potential path felt like a dead end. He was sometimes frustrated or grumpy or momentarily sharp. Some days he would declare that he felt useless and then, always a debater, he would attempt to rebut all of my arguments otherwise. <sighs> I watched him ride these waves of loss and grief and I watched again and again as he seemed to emerge from them with some brilliant, sometimes wacky new idea, some slightly off color joke, or some newfound clarity about how we could take a few more steps towards the world as it should be. In one late night text, Adi wrote, I've been feeling so sad and jealous and frustrated that I don't know how to contribute to the work. Sorry to burden you with it. Two days later, another text from Adi. I began to pull myself up yesterday with a little gratitude writing, and I have the seed of an idea for a home care strategy. We'll write it up. It is with this same kind of clarity, hard earned out of processing deep loss, that he confronted Senator Flake on a plane, that he went on an RV tour and catalyzed a movement, that he hurriedly wrote his memoir, 
and spent many evenings listening to music with Willow and playing chess with Carl. Grief and loss often change us in ways that we cannot predict. And Adi allowed ALS to transform him into a more empathetic and loving person, into an even more powerful advocate, and into a prescient messenger whose call for change reverberated across the country. But Adi was also aware that his words, his loss, his broken heart was not enough. When I joined Be A Hero, he said this, so far we have been opportunistic. We have focused on me and my story and my ability to engage with elected officials. But this approach is not going to lead to transformational change. The medical industrial complex is exceptionally strong. He knew that in order to guarantee health care for all, he would need to join forces with many others who had experienced the pain of tragedy and illness. He knew that only then could we together create meaning from loss and power from pain. As he wrote in Eyes to the Wind, and I quote, it was through collective struggle I began to realize that I could find my personal liberation. I could transcend my dying body by hitching my future to yours, end quote. Adi knew that the fights to transform our healthcare system and strengthen our democracy would outlive him. He knew that he needed a partner in that fight, but we both knew that even two powerful voices would not be enough. We knew that Be A Hero could be a movement of many others like us who had suffered great loss at the hands of our broken healthcare system. People who lose precious days fighting their health insurance companies for care they deserve. Black families who lose pregnant mothers and babies to a racist system that devalues their lives. Children who lose their aging par parents far too early to the system's neglect. Sick people who lose everything they own because they have medical bills they can't pay. Disabled people who lose time at home with the people they love because they can't afford home care. People who find a way somehow to emerge from the loss and pain with a vision of a better world worth building. People who are determined to fight for what they and others deserve. People who hope beyond hope. People who are grieving and brave and powerful and still here. People like Don and Taryn, Robbie and Jacob and Elizabeth who are here with us today in Santa Barbara. People like Evan and Brock, like Rich, Jen, Terrence, Ted, Laura, people like me, people who are powerful together. Adi was the Pied Piper of this movement. I, like many of you, am feeling his loss in powerful waves. It is hard to imagine a world without him strategizing and fighting and laughing by our side, but I am in good company, surrounded by thousands of others in collective grief, and nothing Nothing is more powerful than a movement of the brokenhearted. with 
you all so much uh, for being here for all those beautiful uh, remembrances. Really the only bright spot of the last couple of months has been seeing this incredible community come together and think about Adi, reflect on his legacy, and um, so this has been really beautiful. Uh, but of course, we have to give Adi the last word, so we're gonna do that right now. For 20 years, since I was a freshman on my high school debate team, I have been giving speeches. We can sit quietly as life passes us by, or we can stand up and yell. Yell against injustices, yell against inequality, and yell against complacency. This is a fight for the soul of our country. Yeah. It's a fight for our families and our communities. It's about our identity as a people and our ability to build a community of respect. We have the power of solidarity. When I speak alone, my voice is weak. But when I come together with you, we can be heard loud.
don't you know We're talking about the revolution sounds Don't you know We're talking about the revolution sounds Thank you. 